Good morning. So let's talk about your breakfast. Is it a bacon butty, poached eggs, muesli, toast, fruit or all of the above? Today's programme is all about the choices we make when we pick our food and the knock-on effect those choices have on British farming. Today is all about vegans. Figures from the Vegan Society suggest a huge rise in the number of people sticking to a non-animal product diet here in the UK over the past 10 years. They reckon there are more than half a million vegans in Great Britain now. That's three and a half times as many as were estimated in 2006. Now, that offers obvious challenges for British farmers, but maybe opportunities too. Well, this morning we'll hear views from all sides, but let's start with Juliette Galatly. She is the founder and director of the vegan campaigning organisation Viva. Juliette, what made you decide to go vegan? I care about animals. I went into a pig farm and was being shown around, told about the economic benefits of factory farming, saw these mother pigs kept in crates, looked around, looked in their eyes and just said, literally out loud, I'm sorry, on behalf of the human race, on behalf of myself, for what we do to you, because they were in a terrible state. There were dead piglets lying around. They were just in these huge concrete buildings with no windows. And I thought, actually, if I care about animals, I can't buy into this anymore. And that's when I first went vegetarian, later went vegan. So for you, it's about animal welfare, or is it about not feeling that it's right to kill an animal however well you look after it first at the beginning it was because I was against factory farming and the cruelty and then my philosophy evolved and I just thought actually we can be much much healthier without consuming and killing so why do it at all and then the environmental impacts I became interested in that as well so it became much more all-rounded if you like that's a lot to talk about. Let's <laughs> let's stick with welfare at the moment. Um, joining us is Minette Batters. She's a beef farmer in Wiltshire and also deputy president of the National Farmers Union. How do you respond to those concerns? Well, firstly, you know, we're, we're not against, we're not anti-vegan at all, but we're all for a balanced diet. We're all for a healthy debate and, and debunking the myths. And what I worry about is we are lucky in the UK with the high welfare standards that we have. If you want to eat as a consumer ethically and responsibly, you need to look for the Red Tractor logo or the British Lion mark uh, on eggs. And we have been, I think, ambassadors of welfare in the UK. It's in every farmer's interest. It's a 24-7 job. Um, I had a lamb in my kitchen last night that I was bottle feeding. You know, we are all passionate about high welfare standards. And yet, as Juliette Galatly just described, she was in a very intensive farm. She saw dead animals. It's not always perfect. I think you can find that in, in any industry, and we certainly do not support that at all. But let's talk about and let's showcase the vast majority of fantastic farming businesses that we have that are producing food to very high standards. And let's have a balanced and rounded debate so that consumers can make choices in an honest and understanding way. Well, joining us is Professor John Webster. He's Emeritus Professor of Animal Husbandry at the University of Bristol. He was a founder member of the Farm Animal Welfare Council and uh, first proposed the five freedoms which have gained international recognition as standards for defining the elements of good welfare in farmed animals. Professor Webster, obviously if you find killing animals for food morally wrong, there's not a lot of, of wiggle room, if you like, but when it comes to welfare... How possible is it to have humanely produced meat, humane milk? Well, I've been working constructively for improving animal welfare on farms the last 40 years. My Bristol team has sort of, have really pushed this forward into not only identifying welfare problems, but establishing protocols with the major supermarkets, RSPCA, Freedom Foods, to uh, monitor outcome measures that can guarantee adequate standards of welfare and farms. Now, I recognize absolutely that there have been a great deal of things wrong within farms, not only intensive farms, but, you know, it's my job to try and make things better, not just to cry havoc. Can you, though, have humanely produced milk, for example? Milk is a tricky one. <laughs> I am an omnivore. If I, if I had to choose between eating beef and eating and drinking milk, I would go for grass-fed beef, from calves raised by their mothers on pasture. Those calves have a lovely life. I was driving through Devon yesterday and they looked so content that it really filled my heart with joy. Whereas the dairy farmers have gone, to, and I've been saying this for years, they have pushed too hard, as the broiler farmers did, towards productivity at the expense of almost everything else. And they're creating a 
a system where a lot of cows do suffer. Now, we, we've been working to so improve So why do the things. cows suffer? Just, just describe the process, if you like, and, and where your concerns are around it. In, in a sentence, they're worn out by overwork. They only last for about three lactations or less, classically with infertility and lameness, which are consequences thereof. But basically, they're worn out. Now, we must be fair to say that the breeders have finally got round to recognising this, and they're now trying to breed for a more robust cow, but it's taking time to come through. There are also concerns about the very basics of dairy farming, where you have to take the calf away from the cow so that you can have the milk for us to mm. drink. In intensive systems, if you are going to take the calf away from the cow, it's too well it to have done quickly. If it were taken away in the first hour, the bonds are not so strong and both get over it. Also, the calf is a so-called hiding species, so it is natural for the calf to spend about 23 hours a day away from its mother. There are ways of which you can, and I've been looking at new ideas of actually running little flying herds of cows with the calves at foot milking from bales. It is a problem, but while it's done, it will well it to be done quickly. Minette, if you can just explain, firstly, why it's done, and secondly, how you answer those people who have concerns about the very act of doing that. Well, as John rightly points out, if you take the, the calf away in, in that time scale, that there is no bond. The calf wants milk. That's what it wants. And, you know, they have, and it's in every farmer's interest to make sure they have as much milk as possible. I've done a lot of dairy calf rearing in my time. And those calves have been exceptionally happy because they are surrounded by other calves and they're having ad lib milk as they would with their mothers. So they are not actually missing out on, on anything at all. Juliet Galatly, is, is part of the issue here that we are promoting onto the calf and the cow human values and human experiences? Wildlife biologists will tell you that that's absolutely the right thing to do. We've learnt so much about animal behaviour. Cows have a nine-month pregnancy, the same as us. They give birth, their babies are taken away very quickly, usually between one and three days old. And what's not been mentioned so far is that many of those males are just shot in the head as unwanted byproducts, as Viva has filmed. The mother suffers the calves certainly suffer. It's a horrendous thing that we do to these animals and to pretend that it's OK, that they don't form bonds, is just contemptuous and I'm really quite surprised people are still saying this in 2017. John Webster. I come back to the body. The cattle are a hiding species. The cow goes away naturally to calve. She drops the calf by a hedge and she goes back to the herd. But the calf and cow will only perhaps meet each other for about 10 minutes, four times a day. So it is natural for them to stay apart from their mothers for most of the time until they feel the urge, which is usually the urge, to drink. They do pretty well, actually, when raised well by themselves. It, it isn't ideal. It is by no means ideal. But the alternatives of anything less than weaning at six months, by which time the cow is fed up with the calf anyway, is not really an option. Minette Batters, isn't it also about getting the maximum amount of milk for what is, after all, a dairy business? It is, uh, Charlotte, and I suppose there's a whole ethical challenge here uh, around food prices. You know, food has never been cheaper in this country. We have a lot of people living below the poverty line who have a right, an absolute right, to quality, affordable food. And we as farmers have done our absolute level best to do that. And it's in every farmer's interest to not have a stressed cow because that cow then does not produce the milk that you want. So the stress levels are kept absolutely as low as possible. The welfare standards as high as possible because it's a huge detriment to both and ultimately to the business if that doesn't happen. And as I say, I've done dairy calf rearing and I, I can absolutely promise you I have not seen any stress in the calves that I have reared. They've always had access to fresh water, to hay, had a lovely bit of straw to lie on and been incredibly happy. Let's move on then to the environment. Juliet Galatly, why do you think a vegan diet is better for the environment? Uh, vegan diet's definitely better for the environment. The United Nations have said so. Many scientists, Greenpeace, organisations like that now recognise it. And it's largely because livestock are the second biggest source of global warming gases. Um, it's also animal farming is the biggest cause of loss of species worldwide because of the loss of biodiversity. Largely because there are so many animals now farmed on the planet that literally every last wilderness is being affected as they're being destroyed to make way either directly for grazing 
grazing or to grow crops that then are fed to those animals. Overuse of water is one of the issues that concerns me the most and I've heard many people say that they think the next sort of global war will be over water usage. Only 2.5% of the world's water is fresh and of that most of it is being used for agriculture and for animal agriculture. Now vegan diet uses up much less fresh water than does growing animals for meat and for dairy. The figures are really staggering. It's about 1,000 litres for one kilogram of meat, wheat and about 100 thousand litres for a kilogram of beef and the other one is the land usage it takes a lot more land to grow animals and then kill them for meat or for use them for dairy than it does to feed somebody a vegan diet That's a long list and uh, listening to it in our studio in Oxford is Mark Linus, a writer and environmental activist. He's also a visiting fellow at Cornell University's Alliance for Science. Um, Is it fair to describe, as Juliet just did, the vegan diet is definitely better for the environment? Yes, I think it is because it's so much more efficient. Uh, as, as she said, it takes a huge amount of food to produce a relatively small proportion of meat and, and dairy products. I mean, there's differentials here. So chicken is a lot more efficient than beef and pork sort of in the middle. At a guess, if the whole world went vegan, all sort of seven and a half billion people, you'd probably need to produce less than half or even a quarter of the food that we're producing today. So imagine the huge environmental benefits. You could bring back more rainforest areas. You could rewild vast areas of the land which are currently being used for low intensity uh, animal production so i think all round for the planet it's absolutely far far uh, improved to, to be vegan is it possible though to compare the environmental impact of for instance locally produced cow's milk with imported almond milk Yes, because there's trade-offs on all these different things. I mean, almond milk is a quite a good example of something which is fairly unsustainable because uh, uh, certainly where it's grown in California and places, it takes a lot of fresh water to keep that, and, and you don't get much milk. Imagine how many almonds you have to grind up to get milk from them. So having local dairy would probably be better than that. So there is always going to be trade-offs, and it's a much more complicated picture than, than just a kind of across-the-board uh, rejection, but it's not like you have to drink almond milk if you're going to be vegan. There's soy milk, there's there's rice, oat milk, all of those things which are which are way more sustainable than the almond one. Minette Batters from the National Farmers Union. How do you defend livestock farming from an environmental point of view? Well, agriculture is taking um, the challenges that we face very seriously. We're involved with climate change voluntary action plan. We have a fantastic growing climate in the UK. And our, our beef and sheep is, is integral to a managed environment, to a healthy environment for 25 years now. We've been working uh, with European colleagues on world-leading agri-environment schemes. And, and what we do know is that our grazing herds and flocks are absolutely vital. The tearing action of cows and sheep eating grass. If you go to the Eden Project, even in Cornwall, they will say the hand, the grass here is hand-picked to replicate our grazing herds and flocks. We grow a lot of grass. We don't have lawnmowers for the uplands, so our beef and sheep are vital. We have a lot lower stocking density uh, actually now in the UK than we used to have in the past. It has been going on for millennia. Um, you look at the, the hefted flocks in in the uplands you know sheep that are grazing there that have been there literally for thousands of years and generations of farmers and communities and i think that's what we have to remember here these are communities these are real lives real people who care passionately about what they do passionately about the environment and yes in many parts of the world there are challenges to the environment but in the uk here I think it's a massive value, what our livestock bring, the diversity that they bring, the soil health that we bring. We're seeing a a breakdown, if you like, in soil health with not having enough mixed farming practices. Uh, We would like to see far more of that. Let's talk for a minute about soya. Um, At the moment, the demand for soya for humans is relatively small if you compare it to the use as animal feed. We can grow it here in the UK and are beginning to do so. Um, And there are hopes from staff at Tofuri in Norwich uh, that we will do more. They run what they describe as the country's first micro soya dairy. Uh, Anna Hill went to visit. I'm in the centre of Norwich and I've come to a shop which is completely vegan, a soya dairy and tofu producer. And I'm going in to meet the owner and also the dairy manager because they're the first, they believe, place in the country to have a micro soya 
dairy. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Who have we got here? So you've got Steve Lepper. I'm co-founder of uh, Tofurai. I'm in charge of the dairy. My name's Jenny McCann. I'm the owner of Tofurai here on Pottergate in Norwich. Now today is one of your special days, isn't it? What are you doing today? Today we're making, uh, going to make about 30 litres of milk, soy milk. So the girls are just preparing the grinder to put the beans through. That'll separate the protein and the milk from the bean, discard the waste out of one side of a very fast centrifuge and drop the milk into a boiler where we pasteurise it. So we'll be making around about 30 litres and that will be then hand flavoured and bottled into about half a dozen different flavours. Another day we'll be making milk for tofu. That'll be coagulated and separated, pressed in that machine there. Yeah. Now, where do you get your soya beans from? We would really love to use UK soya. And I've been working closely with Soya UK to try and source some local beans. The problem we have is that at the time of the harvest last year, we had no idea how much we would use, how popular this might be. And so we were looking to buy one tonne, two tonnes. And the animal feed industry wants 29 tonne loads batched off straight away. And I just can't compete with 29 tonne loads. We're about to put an order in for our third ton, that's after six months, so we're up to five or six for the year. But that's a long way short of the 29 tonne stiller that goes off for the animal feed industry. It's interesting, isn't it? Because you're so new and you are the, we think, the only micro soya dairy in the country, then actually you're breaking new ground, aren't you? Yes. And your link with farming then... Yeah is actually quite important. We'd, we'd love to. I mean, in, in this area in particular, we know there is more acres gone under cultivation for soya than ever before. So a massive growth. And we we'll hope that we'll get some out of this year's crop. To get organic beans, we're having to pay a premium, but it's having to be imported. And where are they coming from, your beans? Unfortunately, our beans at the moment, we're having to bring in from China, which is not ideal, to put it mildly. Jenny McCann, is that a problem then? You're the owner of this shop. Soya is having to come all the way from China from an environmental point of view. Is that tricky? Well, yes, I suppose it could be seen as tricky, but I guess we try and reduce our harm wherever we go by being vegan. That might offset some of those carbon footprints. <laughs> Do you see this demand then for vegan food as driving, possibly driving a new soya growth in the UK and Europe? Oh, massively so. Hopefully we're pioneers of that. Soya and uh, vegan food is just massively booming at the moment. You can see that anywhere you go. Jenny McCann there with Anna Hill. Um, Mark Linus, can you compare environmentally the impact of a dairy cow and a flight from China of soya beans? <laughs> that is a difficult thing to do because the dairy cow is probably fed on imported soya as well. Um, so the bulk of animal feeds coming into Europe are, you know, the protein content of that comes from uh, soya imports from North and South America. If you're just drinking soy milk directly from the soy, that, that's still way more efficient than putting it through a beef, either a beef system or just straight into a dairy cow and, and getting milk out the other side. Julia Gilatli, a lot of the food that, that vegans eat is at the moment imported. Is, is that an issue? Do people following this diet actually mind? Yeah, people think about this a lot, but there have been papers um, looking at this where a, a vegan who's consuming foods from around the world is still much more environmentally efficient than a meat and dairy consumer and fish consumer. I mean, you look at the food industry, the worst offenders in the UK, but also globally, first and foremost is red meat, followed by industrial fishing, followed by dairy, followed by poultry, vegan diets, even though you're using foods from around the world, are still much more environmentally friendly. And Manette Batters, could this actually offer an opportunity for British farmers? We heard talk there about UK soil. We spoke earlier this week to Hodmadods in Suffolk, who are encouraging farmers to grow pulses here in the UK. This year, trial lentils? I think there are all sorts of opportunities as we go forward. Um, farmers are, are market driven, you know, they respond to what the market wants, to what our consumer wants. But I think it's really important that we remember how fortunate we are in the UK to have the climate that we have and that we should be making the most of uh, that climate and what we can produce from it. And, you know, that is vital going forwards, that we work with the system that we have. We 
feed a lot of grass in this country. We have a lot of dairy herds that, that graze outside. We have outdoor pigs in this country. No other country in the world uh, mm. can do that. So we are very fortunate, I think, with our climatic conditions. And we must remember that and not make um, comparisons uh, here with what, with what we can do with other countries in the world. Mark Linus. What farming is, is the simplification of the natural ecosystem so that it's all diverted towards producing whatever humans want for their food supply. So there's always going to be knock-on effects with removing whatever the natural species would be or the wider environmental impacts that uh, Juliet was just talking about. But at the same time, I think we can have a kinder and a friendlier system, but it would probably be more expensive. Can I come in? I'd love to come in on this because, just John Webster here, because there's a terrible misunderstanding about the efficiency or alleged inefficiency of ruminants. I agree entirely we feed far too much food to animals, particularly pigs and poultry, that we could eat ourselves. But a dairy cow on a Somerset diet where I live, lives about 70% off complementary feeds, that's grass which we can't digest ourselves, or the byproducts which, which we choose not to eat ourselves. So the dairy cow, by virtue of working very hard, I agree, produces about 50% more food, nutrients, energy and protein for us than she eats in a form we could eat ourselves and that makes her a very efficient creature indeed. Yes but the problem is that the British landscape has been put over to these monocultures of grasslands which are incredibly no, bad for, for no. Britain's wildlife um, you know, woodlands farm. have been destroyed over decades and decades and decades and we're left with these landscapes of just grasslands for animals to graze on where, or to grow, where, or to grow monocultures to feed to the animals. Now, curious enough, Brazil you're talking about, I'm going there next month, uh, is p pioneering silvopastoral systems. That's grass, shrubs and trees, which gives biomass, it gives milk, it gives beef, and also the amount of carbon sequestration you get in that case is drawing far more out carbon out of the atmosphere than the methanes are contributing in the form of methane. So it's actually a lung of the earth, a well-managed grassland system with trees and shrubs is environmentally very, very efficient indeed. But that's not what we've got in the UK, and that's not what most of the world has got. <laughs> well, no, yeah, yeah, you, 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 should, you should go outside and have a look. I'm going to jump in there, because before we end, and we are rapidly running out of time, I just want to talk about something which was raised by quite a lot of people who got in touch with us over the week, and that's the tone and the language being used in these debates. Um, they describe it as becoming more aggressive, more anti-farmer. Uh, dairy is scary, humane milk is a myth. Is that fair? Um, I think it's just about telling the truth. I think we've got to wake up to the facts that, for example, no mammal needs to drink milk after weaning. Nature did not intend for us to do that. So it's just a matter of getting the facts out there. Um, it's not about being anti-farmer, actually, because everybody needs to eat. We just want farmers to do things in a kind, responsible way. Minat Batters from the National Farmers Union. I, I just take a lot of exception to what Julia has said. Uh, it just is plain wrong. You know, I as a farmer care passionately about animal welfare and I know all my farming colleagues do the same. I've said earlier to look out for the red tractor logo, to look out for the lion mark on eggs. We're proud of what we produce. I think we face a massive challenge with education and children and fellow consumers actually really understanding in an honest way what food production in this country is about. We need to address that in the school curriculum, but it's got to be balanced. And the moment the debate is, is unfair, it's heavy handed and it's not honest. And I that's what I dislike. I think these schemes like Red Tractor um, and so forth are just marketing cons. We've filmed in so many farms in the last two years. We've done so many investigations. One pig farm that supplied a major supermarket was Red Tractor approved. The piglets were just literally kept in all I could describe as a battery cage. It was absolutely appalling. You're highlighting, Julia, I'll take you out. You know, come out on Open Farm Sunday, June the 11th, and see what is going on because you're we portraying do. a picture that is just not honest. We do. And we, it's we, not we, true. We, we have filmed in some of the biggest, for example, um, places where well, uh, birds are caged for eggs. Half of the UK's uh, birds that's are kept in that way. We've taken in television no, companies with us. Wrong. Absolutely you're appalling. It's no, no, wrong. No. You are not birds that the birds truth. that. Okay, I'm no going to jump in there so again forth. because we we can trade experiences till we're all blue in the face. Um, Juliet Galatly, will you come out with us on Open Farm Sunday and have a look round some Absolutely. farms with me? Yes, Minette. so long as you come around the typical farms that we film in. We just film in the absolute typical um, to show people what's really going on. And I'm very happy to go with you. You come with us. Okay. Let, well, I look forward to walking around a typical farm. Um, 
thank you all very much indeed for joining us today. That's Juliette Galatli from Viva, Minette Batters from the National Farmers Union, uh, environmentalist Mark Linus and uh, Professor John Webster. Uh, that's it from us for this week. I'm Charlotte Smith and the producer in Bristol was Emma Campbell.